I don't speak any more Italian. I speak uh, Portuguese and I speak English. So when I come here, I speak in a mixture of the two and I do that and everybody understands more or less what I'm saying. Um, so a quick introduction to, to me. Uh, yeah, my name is Peter Gaston. I work as a creative technologist, at a company called Rehab Studio in London. Uh, if you want to write me, tweet me, rate me, that's my Twitter and my, and my blog address there. Um, I'm going to start by talking about kind of what's coming soon. Sorry, I'm going to talk about what's coming soon, but I'm going to start by looking at the past a little bit. This is called the ASCII Red. This was Intel's supercomputer. It cost 43 million pounds in today's money. I don't know what that is in euro, a lot of euro. Um, it could process 1.8 flops um, and it retired in 2000. Uh, this is the PlayStation 3. It was launched in 2005. It cost 425 pounds and it could process 1.8 teraflops. This is Watson. We've already met Watson this morning. Watson was built initially for one purpose, and that's to go on a game show called Jeopardy in the United States and to be able to take on the human contestants at this game show. It took them 10 years to develop this system. Um, it's hard to get costs, but we're looking at probably about 12 million pounds again. Um, and after that 10 years, it went on the game show and it beat the human champions of Watson by, uh, of Jeopardy by a factor of three, just wiped with them. Um, that was in 2011. Four years later, this is the Pognitoys Dino. It cost 80 pounds um, and it's powered by Watson. In 2012, Google used 16,000 connected processors to teach a computer how to detect a cat, to teach itself how to detect a cat. Um, three years later, the same technology could correctly identify this picture as a man using his laptop while his cat looks at the screen. The reason I'm showing you this mainly is to kind of convey the point that things can change very quickly, and especially artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is becoming very good very quickly. Um, basically, it's a combination of things, very cheap parallel computing, lots of data, better algorithms. Um, but essentially, in the last three or four years, there's been this massive breakthrough that's made artificial intelligence very, very easy. Um, you probably saw last week the news that uh, Google's uh, AlphaGo beat uh, the World Go champion um, at the game of Go. So this was something that people predicted that computers were at least 10 years away from doing. That it's one of the most complex strategic games there's ever existed, way more than chess. And people said the human champion would just wipe the floor with Google. The human champion lost 4-1 over five games. There's a lot of strands to um, artificial intelligence. You'll sometimes hear it referred to as deep learning, machine learning, neural networks, uh, as we saw this morning, cognitive computing. The big breakthroughs really have been in what's called uh, the neural networks, which I'm, I'm kind of referring to artificial intelligence. They work by you give them a piece of information, there's a whole bunch of little nodes that do the job. They either classify what they think that thing is, or they, um, or they kind of uh, analyze. So they analyze or classify, and then they pass what their result is up to the next node. So uh, if you give it a picture, it will kind of keep passing it up through various nodes until it recognizes what a face might look like, and then it will keep going until it recognizes that's not a human face, it's a cat face, etc. It's like our brains it will give you a very rough result very quickly or a more precise result very slowly. One of the ways this has been used, a really nice example, was uh, this is from, some, uh, from a, a university in Germany where they took uh, the style of famous works by famous artists and then they uh, analyzed them using these deep learning systems and then they gave them photographs. So you can see at the top we've got a Van Gogh painting and at the bottom we've got a photograph of a street somewhere and it breaks down each of them into its component parts and at the end can output the same painting in the styles of the various old masters. This is not the same as just putting a Photoshop filter on it. It's actually learned what is sky and how Van Gogh would paint sky and what is water and how Turner would paint water and it's kind of analyzed these things and can output and basically fake new works by the old masters. 
So artificial intelligence can make existing services much smarter. It can also create a whole bunch of new ones. Uh, you probably can't have failed to notice in the last couple of years that recommendation engines are now kind of everywhere. If you use Pocket, if you use Apple News, Google News, um, Netflix, they're all built on these learning algorithms that learn what people like to watch, learn what similar content is, and then recommend things back to you. Um, also, photographs. Uh, photo services for hosted photo services have got way smarter. If you use Google Photos, it's really, really smart to search. Without you ever telling it what's in your photos, you can search them, and it will show the photos back to you. And it can understand quite abstract concepts. It can understand the difference between uh, a bird and a painting of a bird, for example. Um, Facebook have got some really smart stuff that they're kind of hiding away from us a little bit at the moment. They are analyzing your photos to learn what's in them, but they're not kind of reporting that back to you. They're showing it back to you in the form of more targeted classified advertising. Uh, last year, if you want to get really scared, Facebook uh, came up with this algorithm that could recognize who is in a picture even if it couldn't see their face just by um, their clothes and the similar to the clothes that you've worn in your other pictures where it does know your face. Uh, even if the face is obscured, it can kind of recognize that you're in there anyway with about 83% accuracy. And personal assistants are huge at the moment. Um, apart from the big ones like Siri and Cortana, you've also got very targeted ones. Uh, this one on the left is a service called uh, Mona, which is a personal shopping assistant. It learns what you like, and it gives you back recommendations that you can buy through Mona. And uh, on the right is Luca, and Luca is a restaurant or food recommend um, personal assistant. So again, you ask it, you tell it where you want to go and what you'd like to eat. You suggestions, you rate those suggestions at the end, and it kind of reports back to you and keeps learning your tastes and will give you more targeted recommendations every time you use it. One of the big breakthroughs uh, has been in natural language processing. Computers are now much more able to understand the way we write and the way we talk. This has been a difficult problem for years. Uh, voice recognition has been around for a long time, but the error rate has been so high that it's never kind of um, taken off until the last couple of years. Uh, but now it's everywhere. And I'm going to take a slight detour from what I'm talking about very quickly to, um, to talk about this. Natural language processing is kind of shifting the way that services are going from the graphical user interface to the conversational user interface. WhatsApp, probably a lot of people, most people know WhatsApp. It's huge. It's got... Um, like 900 million monthly active users, which is an enormous number. Uh, last year, they reported that WhatsApp, people on WhatsApp send 30 billion messages a day, which compares to 20 billion SMS messages per day. Um, and the reason that Facebook bought WhatsApp and the reason it's so valued is because of this chart here. This chart here shows uh, the number of people globally online since 2012 and predicted up to 2018, the numbers on the left are billions. So in 2012, there were about 2.6 billion people online globally, and uh, just over a billion of those were using messaging apps. In 2018, there's predicted to be 4 billion people using the internet globally, and about 3.5 billion of those will be using messaging apps. So there's a huge, they're growing much faster than social networks are. I think uh, Facebook Messenger, is on track to overtake the number of monthly active users from Facebook itself, um, probably in the next two or three years as well. And there's nothing you can't do in a messaging app, a messaging app that you can do on the rest of the phone. If you have video, music, utilities, gaming, you'd used to have a separate app for each of those. But as we're seeing in the model of Asia, especially companies like WeChat, who I'll come on to in a second, you can do all of those stuff inside one interface. So everything that was in a separate app or was done in a website will soon be able to be done through the single unified interface of Facebook Messenger or WeChat. As an example of that, uh, WeChat allows you to, uh, the app on the left shows a kindergarten. You can, the parents can get uh, live updates on their students' process, pr progress through WeChat. And on the right, it shows their financial services. So you can send money to people, play the lottery, order a taxi, send, uh, pay your credit card. And they've even started to offer banking and mortgage services 
all through the interface of a chat app. It's a messaging app has become a messaging platform, and this is a huge growth area. Uh, we're seeing this through companies like Clio, who uh, now offer banking services through this conversational interface. You can talk to your as if it were a person, as if it were just a contact in your list, and this is made possible by natural language processing. In the past, you could do this, it would be like phoning the Press one to do this, press two to do that, press three. Nowadays, you can just chat to it and ask it the questions you want. And people like this because most of the time, people don't want to talk to their bank. They just want to talk to their account. They, want to they just want the information, not the graphical layer on top of it. So we're seeing this become a huge growth area. Um, we're even seeing news companies start to explore using chat messaging. Uh, Forbes, the business paper, they've just recently launched a bot for Telegram. And Vogue have recently released a WhatsApp uh, interface. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen or used Slack. Slack is a massive, massive growth company. Um, it's got about two and a half million daily active users at the moment, which isn't that much, but maybe. But 20% of those have come on in the last three months. And uh, Slack is not just a chat app, it's a chat form. You can, you can use it to uh, extend in multiple ways. Um, in, and it goes far, far beyond the simple one-to-one -one or group chat that it started with. So Facebook Messenger are aware of this. This is what they said at the beginning of the year. Threads are the new apps. Basically, that means why use a graphical interface for most people that gets in the way when you could just ask its questions and services through the medium of, um, of Messenger, of just talking to it directly. So last year, they launched uh, Facebook Messenger Platform, which started off quite low-key with lots of um, kind of gifts and videos and pictures and just kind of funny stuff. But we're starting to see it become much more powerful with um, shopping. Uh, Everlane, at the moment, is their preferred partner. But you can buy and track your orders through a conversational interface through Facebook Messenger. And uh, Uber, or taxi implementation, if you have Uber or Lyft, we could just be having a conversation between ourselves. We talk about a place we want to go. That becomes an active link. We hit that. Uber sends a cab to pick us up and take us there. We've never left Facebook Messenger to do this at any point. And kind of bringing it back to the subject where I started, uh, Facebook Messenger, they've recently released, um, only in the US at the moment, what's called M. M is this personal assistant. So it, do you, you can ask it anything. You can ask it questions about anything. You can even get it things for you. You can get it to order flowers or order food. You just ask it a question. You have it as a contact in Messenger, and it does the stuff for you. So it could have been done a few years ago. It was possible. The technology was there. But you would have to have a huge pool of human assistants answering all the queries. Um, what we're seeing now is this kind of hybrid system where at the moment, humans are answering all the queries, but all the queries um, are fed into their learning systems and they will learn what people ask for, how they ask it, and what the responses are, and they will start um, training a system to do this by itself. So over time, the involvement of humans will drop and the involvement of AI will increase hugely. So within five, six years, maybe 80 or 90% of, of the queries will be answered by bots. Uh, this provides this scale. If Facebook were going to roll this out to their 1.5 billion monthly active users, they couldn't possibly do it with humans answering the questions. They would have to do it with AI. And so AI provides the scale that makes this stuff possible. Um, it also can actually take away the user interface altogether, what they're calling no UI. Uh, again, this is possible through voice recognition. Uh, between 2012 and 2015, Google's voice recognition error rate dropped from 26% to 8%, which is huge. Uh, that's the difference from getting one word in four wrong to getting one word in 12 wrong. Uh, that was in May last year, and we, pro we think it's probably halved again since that, so it's probably about 4% error rate, which is incredible. And um, Baidu, which are a Chinese company, uh, they say that 10% that of their search queries are done through voice now. 
Um, and that's approximately 500 million voice search queries every single day going through Baidu. And it's enabled this um, series of interfaces where there's almost this series of uh, services where there's almost no interface apart from in the result. You've got Siri, you've got Google, you've got Cortana. And uh, the biggest growing one, the one to watch, is uh, Alexa, or Echo rather, by Amazon, whose assistant is called Alexa. And this is just a physical object that sits in your house and just listens, and you can ask it anything, and it just reads back to you. There's no UI to it at all. Um, they've recently re released a whole new range of things that add onto this, these little dots that can extend it. There's a portable one you can take on holiday with you. Uh, it's in your Fire TV box. And so you ask it questions, and at first it was things like, um, what's the weather like? Or play me some music, or preferably buy me something from Amazon. Um, but nowadays they've started integrating things like Uber, as we saw before, and even to do banking through Bank of America. You can do all this stuff just talking to Alexa. Ask it a question about your account, it'll give you back the information you that you want. And there's no UI involved at all. And we're seeing a whole new range of home robot assistants coming out to do the same thing. There's Jibo, or the slightly uh, skanky looking uh, open source version called Mycroft. Um, but the point is that this stuff's now possible because of the breakthroughs in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and having taken over now your home and your phone, um, AI is going to come for your job. There's um, recent research has showed um, the, the more predictable your job is, and uh, the more it deals with numbers and words, the more kind of open it is to being automated by services powered by AI. If you deal largely with abstractions, and there's a lot of variety in your work, you're probably okay. Um, if you deal a lot with maybe pictures and people, um, and your job kind of is sometimes, um, sometimes variable, but sometimes predictable, maybe you should get a bit nervous. But if you're down here and you're doing a lot of work that's exactly the same every day, it's very predictable, very easy to copy, then um, there's a very good chance that you're going to become uh, s surplus to requirements in the next few years. Um, as an example of showing this in action, in finance departments of big American companies since 2004, there's been a 40% reduction in the number of jobs available because a lot of these systems have been automated already. I asked the BBC how likely is it that I, as a, as a kind of digital professional, would lose my job, and they said, well, not likely, to be honest. It's about 21% that over the next 15 to 20 years, my job could be done by a computer. Well, they say not very likely, but that means that one in five of us could see our roles automated within the next 15 to 20 years, depending on what we do. I'm not saying we're all going to be fired. I don't want to kind of alarm you that badly. But we're going to see the job pool kind of shrink, like the 40% reduction in finance departments. Um, if you write copy that's very easy to write, like this. This is a, a, a report about earthquakes across the US. This is already written by a bot. It used to be written by a person. And there are services like Automated Insights, which will just let you give them data, and they will write based on the data you give them. We're starting to see this in news organizations, kind of writing summaries, associated press. We're seeing those jobs start to go already. Uh, if you're a coder, don't think you're safe. MIT are working on a system called Helium that can, without having any prior knowledge of the code it's given, can understand how to optimize it um, and rewrite it to be better, especially like old, bad code. Um, they, they're, it's very experimental at the moment, but it works. They gave it some old Photoshop plugins to look at, um, and it increased the, the uh, performance of these plugins by between 75 and 500%. And we're starting to see a rise in services like these. Uh, this is Download Me, where if you just tell it a few things about yourself, if you give it your social profiles, your Facebook address, your Twitter address, whatever, it creates a mobile app for you. Or App Machine will create a mobile website for you, given the same data. Or The Grid will create uh, a, a fully responsive website design for you, just based on some in simple information that you give it. And it doesn't have to be a lot of information. App Machine will just do something just given your Facebook name, and in 10 minutes you have um, a mobile site prepared for you. 
people are criti criticizing this, of course, because, you know, at the moment, these things are not great. If you look at the sites that the grid output so far, they're really kind of not that much more impressive than, say, uh, a template, a WordPress template. But this is kind of where the mobile phone was 30 years ago. This is one of the first mobile phones used in Britain. Um, and we're about at this stage of using AI to lay out websites and things for us at the moment. We can see the difference between that and what we have now. We're going to see the difference between what's available in AI now and the same thing over the next 10 years. And people say, well, a machine will just output the same stuff. It's going to look identical to all the, every other website that's out there. Kind of like this. Um, but these were all designed and built by humans. That, to me, looks like it could be very easily automated. Uh, Travis Gertz wrote a fantastic article. Uh, the point is that he says we've kind of, by just following trends and not really thinking about what we're doing, we've turned digital design into a human assembly line. And to me, a human assembly line sounds like it should fit right about there. He says, we've designed ourselves into an environment that's ripe for automation. And you, you might be thinking, well, a, a bot couldn't do my job, an AI couldn't do my job. And you're right, but it can do bits of your job. It can do little bits in isolation that eventually will start doing in the job pool. <coughs> so at the moment, you might be feeling like Lee Sedol, 3 nil down against AlphaGo and without any hope in sight. But there is a little bit of hope in sight. That's why I'm here. I wouldn't stand up in front of you and just dash all your dreams, especially the students amongst you who are just starting your careers. Um, the big hope that we have, there's a couple of things. One of the main ones, I think, is that humans are unpredictable, mushy bags of irrationality and emotion. Computers can never be that. Computers can never be subject to the whims of hormones and the whims of kind of, oh, I, I'm a bit bored today. I'll try something different. This creativity is a tool that we can use. Um, how many of you have seen Deep Dream before? Deep Dream is like a visualization of what Google's machines are basically thinking when they're going through this identification process. It's a, it's a tool for visualizing a neural network. Um, and while it's definitely clever, it's kind of proof that computers do not have good taste. Good taste is essentially a human uh, characteristic. Many of you have probably heard of this thing called the Turing test. The Turing test is to see whether essentially a human can talk to a machine and not know that it's talking to a machine. Um, nobody's passed it so far, but people are getting close. I think this is going to be passed very, very, very quickly because you can just game the system. You can fool it. You can have it, back it up with one of these learning systems and just have enough in there to make people think they're talking to a machine. Maybe you already do. Maybe if you go onto an automated support website and you're typing in something, you might be talking to a bot already. But there's another uh, less well-known test called the Lovelace test, uh, named after Ada Countess Lovelace, who was, some say, the, the original computer programmer. Um, and in the Lovelace test, the criteria is that the artificial agent has to produce an original program. It could be music, it could be a poem, but something that it was not engineered to produce. And it must be able to reproduce it, and the people who created that agent must not be able to explain how it did it. So the idea is that this test is impossible for computers to pass. Andrew Ng, who's a guy who's a major player in, AI, uh, in the development of AI, used to be at Google, is now at Baidu. He says that teaching innovation and creativity is probably the best chance we have for the future. This is Fan Hui. Fan Hui was the European champion of Go. Um, and about six months ago, or maybe a little bit longer, he played Google's AlphaGo machine. And he lost 5-0. He got the, it wiped the floor with him. But instead of being kind of disheartened, he said, well, I want to join your team. I want to learn how to play against this machine. I want to help it become even better. So he's now part of the AlphaGo team. Um, when he was beaten, he was number 63 in the world, in the, in the world, 633. And after playing against AlphaGo for about six months, he's now up in the high 300s. So he's become a much, much better AlphaGo player 
by playing against this machine, or I'm with this machine. Uh, famously, in 1997, Gary Kasparov played the IBM computer Deep Blue at chess. Again, they said Deep Blue should never be able to beat the world champion. Sorry, in 1996, he played it first, and Kasparov won. But then they asked for a rematch in 1997, and this time Kasparov lost. They, pro they learned from him, and they programmed the machine to make it even better to beat the world champion. But again, instead of getting disheartened and giving up, he saw the opportunity in this. And he created what's called advanced chess, or centaur chess, where it's like doubles of man plus machine against man plus machine. Um, based on that, there's now what's called uh, freestyle chess, where you pick up uh, from a machine, from a you can use a reference team to help you, basically, against people who have the same advantage. So since Kasparov was beaten in 1997, there are now twice as many chess grandmasters in the world as there were then. So people have been made smarter by these machines. They've been made more clever. They've been made more able. They've used them to enhance themselves. And AI is a tool that we can use to provide better services to our customers. We're going to have to learn how to do that. We're going to have to learn new methods, frameworks, new scaffolds, new templates. It's going to be challenging. But the advantage is that I said earlier, artificial intelligence is becoming very good very quickly. The big advantage of that also is that it's becoming very available very quickly. We met earlier again in Watson, and we saw the introduction about Watson this morning, and we saw the introduction to Watson service. Now Watson has, Watson has cost X many millions of euro of dollar, and taken a long time to develop. It's now available to us using a web interface that we can access through Node or Python or Java that will make our systems much, much smarter. Um, and as they said earlier, I really suggest you go along to their booth and take a look and ask what Watson can do for you because it is very smart and it is very, very surprisingly easy to get set up and running. But they're not the only game in town. Uh, Microsoft have Project Oxford which sits on uh, their Azure platform, does kind of similar stuff. So it has computer vision APIs, it has um, language understanding, speech APIs, uh, mostly for Windows or Android SDKs at the moment. But they, they're planning a, a JavaScript SDK soon. And recently released their Cloud Vision API, which understands the images you give it. Um, they're probably leading in terms of how smart their system is for image recognition. They've got the best hardware, they've got the best people, and uh, they've got the best data. I gave it this picture of me recently, and it returned. I gave it to all the systems, and they all correctly identified that it was a person in a forest. But Google's went just that one step further and actually described the type of forest it was to me. So it's not forest, it's a temperate broadleaf and mixed forest. The reason Google services are so much smarter, as well as their software, is they have so much data. They've been indexing the web for, what, 20 years now? They have loads and loads and loads of information. Data in the 21st century is like oil in the 18th century. This is what drives our systems. Um, and we've barely scratched the surface of using it yet. Uh, Google also released this thing called TensorFlow, which is not so much consumer facing, it's very low level. It's what powers all their learning services. And they've made it available for nothing. Just go out there and download it. It's in a Docker, you can run it in Python. They've given it away for nothing because it's not this that's valuable. It's all of the thousands and millions, thousands of millions of pieces of data that they've been indexing for the last years. That's what's valuable in this, not the software. But you don't have to use any of these big services if you don't want to. There are a lot of smaller startups that encourage devs to get involved and to use them. Um, things like uh, MetaMind has really good image recognition and um, text understanding tools. Clarify have been around for a few years. They're probably of the kind of the independents. They're the ones that have the best um, machine vision tools at the moment. They're also working really well on understanding the content of videos, not just photos. So if you want to upload videos to them and actually see kind of live analysis of what's happening in the videos, these guys have got good tools. Uh, Wit are, uh, used to be in indie. They got bought by Facebook recently, uh, last year. 
um, but they're still free and open and available for you to use. They're not kind of been adopted into Facebook services. They're still a, an open service. I like them because their interface is so simple and because they've got really wide range platform support. Um, they, they work literally everywhere. Uh, SoundHound, does anybody know SoundHound? They're like a music recognition tool. You can, if you play a song and hold SoundHound, it'll the song is playing. Um, well, they've been developing this for 10 years and they're using that same technology now to do um, speech understanding and do it very, very, very well. They can, uh, excuse me, they can understand really complex sentences. You can speak to them for about half an hour and gets pretty much everything. Um, API.ai, also a really easy to use uh, text understanding and voice search tool. Again, lots of different tools. Whatever platform you work on, you can use these guys. Um, they've also recently introduced a published Slack uh, bot, so you can just create services that extend Slack just by using these guys. And uh, Reinfer are a new service just set up in London, which do allow you to set up these conversational interfaces, and it powers the dialogue below it. Um, a motion AI, I haven't used these guys yet, but they've just got this really simple drag and drop interface to build this stuff. There's not there's, there's not even a lot of coding skill in required to get involved in doing this one. And the best way for you to learn about this stuff is the best is the way I think that I learned about it. Just play with it. Just give it a go. There's loads of people out there doing fun, interesting stuff with these things. Um, this guy took Google's TensorFlow and he fed it the script of every episode of Friends there's ever been. And this script started learning how to do episodes of Friends. Uh, this is an actual extract. extract. Uh, you can imagine Chandler says, well, I proposed to my shoe. Um, all the dinner enters and Monica says, happy Gandalf. You know, it doesn't make sense. It's writing, it, you can recognize it as kind of in the structure that it's working on. If you kept feeding this through networks, Defining it, it would start making some kind of weird sense. Google has been working on recreating the voice of Shakespeare and recreating the voice of famous authors and poets by just feeding them everything they ever read. This is another fun experiment. Um, this guy took kind of two systems. So he, he got one system to try to understand the content of a photo. And then with the other system, he fed it um, either the text of romance novels or Taylor Swift lyrics, and then he got the text to try to describe what was happening in the image. This image of some romantic camels um, was described like this by Taylor Swift. Um, I mean, it, it, I'm not a huge Taylor Swift fan, but you could imagine her probably some writing something like that. And it does kind of, it, it recognizes that there are animals and that they're definitely, that one loves the other very much. It recognizes that. Or do what we did and just build a bot. We used Watson's dialogue system and we put it into a Telegram interface. Telegram is another messaging app which has a really good open API. Uh, a lot of the other ones have closed APIs. Telegram is really good for experimenting with. Um, and we got a T-Rex or what we got information about a T-Rex, a Tyrannosaurus Rex from all across the web. And we kind of created this bot with the personality of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Or it rather, it answered questions about Tyrannosaurus Rex. The fact is it's not, you know, I'm not trying to impress you with the fact that we made this because it's really quite simple. The thing was we got the software, or the software was in place in one day and then the next four days we just spent kind of tweaking um, the, the results that it was given. It's so easy to get this stuff up and running. The tools are there right now for you to go out and start building and start implementing it. We're seeing a lot of sites experiment now we're using things. Um, the North Face have kind of created this conversational interface for personalized recommendations. You can do this stuff on their site already. You could do it through like a drop down menu by highlighting a load of different links and filters, but they've just made it really easy by asking you questions. Well, how about um, Watson powered dating? So they, they, this is kind of really trying to learn. People tell it much more about themselves and Watson builds up a highly detailed profile of the person and tries to match them together. AI is going to be coming to a lot more products soon. It's becoming a cornerstone of the things we build. This is going to be interesting for us and difficult, I think. Um, of all the kind of forms of design we have to consider at the moment, visual design, motion design, interaction, 
design, experience, service, emotion, I think we're going to have to start adding intelligence design, and we're going to gonna have to start adding conversation design. If we're creating these systems that talk to you in a natural way, we need to make sure the tone of voice is right. Imagine going up to your bank and kind of ordering from your bank, and it starts asking you about the football and then goes, yeah, so listen, sorry, mate, we're not going to be able to do that mortgage. It's not the way you want your bank to talk to you. you get that wrong, it's going to make people very, very, very annoyed. Um, and it also needs to be appropriate and happen at the appropriate times. We've seen before um, what happens when someone tries to interrupt you at the inappropriate moment. And the same problems we've had in the past trying to build the things we do now will still be there for the new methods of interaction. Um, old problems still apply as well as new ones. This was quite funny recently. Um, NPR, Public Radio in America, did a program about the Amazon Echo. And the people at home who had an Amazon Echo when they were listening to that program, the Echo got activated by the person talking about it on the radio and turned up the thermostat and all kinds of other weird second-hand effects. Um, because it being mentioned. People who buy Samsung TVs, uh, Samsung have like a voice activation, voice control. Um, what people realized after they started using it is that everything you said got sent off to Samsung servers and then evaluated by human operators. So although most of the time you were just saying, you know, change the channel, you could say something like, um, change the channel. Oh, by the way, my bank account number is one, two, three, four, five, six. And it would pick up all that stuff at the same time and people would be reading that. If data is the new oil, then privacy is the new climate change. This was a big one recently. Mattel launched their first AI-powered Barbie uh, called Hello Barbie, and it would listen to your child and it would speak back. Um, but again, the same problem. The things that you were saying, the things that your child said to Barbie would be sent off to third-party cloud servers and they would be evaluated by other people. And when people found this out, of course, they were shocked, they were appalled. Um, there's kind of no way to do that stuff at the moment without this cloud power behind it. But we have to be really respectful of the things of people's homes, that we're putting these things into people's homes. Um, and security as well. Um, this is a doll called My Friend Kayla. My Friend Kayla was a, a kind of a, a smart doll, and it was attached to your phone via Bluetooth connection. Um, and people worked out you could hijack the Bluetooth connection, and you could make Kayla say things um, that she really wasn't supposed to be saying at all. Um, so just finishing up. So this is a guy called Jeff Dean who works at what's called the Google Brain. Google Brain is Google's AI that's powering everything they do now. He says this is going to enable us to build new and interesting products that wouldn't have been possible before and maybe in areas that we're not really working in today. The kind of the ready availability of deep learning happened so quickly that we haven't really had time to stop and think about it. It's all happened in three years. It's been incredible. A year and a half ago, I wouldn't have been able to build any of this stuff, or I would have had to build custom services and spend a lot of money on setting up the stack behind it. That now these are consumer-facing products, and they're very, very, very cheap, or in some cases, free. It's happened, it's improved suddenly. Um, and it is going to take some jobs at the industry, I think, unless we adapt to it. But it offers us a whole load of new opportunities. And it can make what you do better. Um, I want to finish just one, one, one more quote. And this is from Lee Sedol, the former champion, world champion of Go. And he said, playing against Go made him question human creativity. When he saw the moves that AlphaGo was making, he wondered whether all along he'd been actually playing it right. Maybe he'd been approaching it completely the wrong way. And it made him realize that he has to study Go more. And I think that's what we have now, at this early opportunity to get involved and start learning, start working out what it can do for us and allowing us to make kind of new and interesting services. Thank you very much for listening. I don't have time for questions. Do we have time for questions? I don't think so.
if not, I'll be around all day. Come up and see me and buy me a coffee and I'll talk to you for hours about this stuff. It's not a problem at all. Cheers. Thank you.